All right, it's time for our second talk for the day, in the first half. Uh, this one's by Rafael Franska and Tim Ebert. Uh, we were just having a chat about the fact that they're speaking for the first time at such a conference. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's, let's give them a round of applause, cheer them on, <laughs> and yeah. And they'll be talking about credentials rotation in Kubernetes. All right, take it away, guys. Right. So thanks for the introduction. Welcome, everybody, to our talk. This is Tim. My name is Raphael. And as already mentioned, we will cover the topic of credentials rotation in Kubernetes today. So setting the scene, and what is actually the problem that we'd like to talk about? Um, so if you have set up your Kubernetes cluster yourself once, or if you're just using one, then you are probably aware of yeah, the, the vast majority of credentials that come with such a cluster. So there are CAs and certificates, there are tokens and keys of various kinds, a Cube API server talking to etcd with a client certificate, then there are pods uh, that use service account tokens talking to the API server again. This entity needs to encrypt secrets in etcd, and then there are even human users or operators that have Cube configs or SSH keys to interact with the nodes. Yeah, and if you now think about uh, managing and rotating all these things, then actually don't worry if you start to feel like this. Actually, that's how we felt when we started to look into the subject matter of the course of the past year. And we'd actually like to present uh, a few insights and learnings that we made on our journey. Um, just to complete setting the scene, we are working on this project, um, Gardener, which is open source. Um, if you don't know it, it's actually a Kubernetes extension for managing uh, further Kubernetes clusters as a service. So think GKE for basically any infrastructure or environment. And uh, this system is actually built for scale by using this Kubernetes in Kubernetes model, also sometimes referred to as Kubeception. What is interesting about it as part of this talk is that uh, basically Kubernetes is the workload or the application that we deploy again in a Kubernetes cluster. So yeah, we, we see it here in this diagram. Uh, we have a seed cluster that's just a regular Kubernetes cluster where we create namespaces. Those are these colored boxes. And in these namespaces, the control plane, etcd, maybe further controllers are deployed as yeah, regular pods. So that means we have Kubernetes everywhere, also for the secrets management. And um, yeah, what we will discuss today is, yeah, of course, applicable to Kubernetes, but can also be applicable to any other application that runs uh, in a cluster. Coming back to the rotation topic, and yeah, thinking about it at scale, as said, the system is built for managing hundreds or even thousands of clusters, and yeah, if you now try to, to come to an approach how to you orchestrate all the rotation and management of these credentials, then you pretty fast come to the conclusion that you need to achieve these goals in order to survive. So you want to have a disruption-free process. You don't want to cause any downtimes during the, the credentials rotation. You want uh, minimal ops, so some human involvement might be needed for some cases, but this, this should be as minimal as possible and as fully automated as possible. So we have basically two main topics today that we'd like to discuss. One is about short-lived credentials. So those are mostly things that can be yeah, rotated quite frequently and quite dynamically. And uh, in the context of this talk, that's actually the service account tokens of pods running in the cluster. And the other big section is about more static, uh, static credentials that need a bit more of yeah, orchestration, human involvement. Um, those would be the CAs and keys in the, in the cluster. So then let's get started with the service accounts. I assume pretty much everybody is aware of this. So whenever there is a pod that needs to communicate with the API server, then this is done as part of a service account. That's like the identity of this pod. And the service account is simply referenced in the spec. And what then happens when you apply this to the Kubernetes cluster uh, is actually that you will get this kind of volume since Kubernetes 1.22, that's a projected volume, which has several sources, most prominently the, the service account token with some expiration seconds, the CA certificate of the cluster, and then, this is not visible here, the namespace of the pod itself. What else you will get is for all of your containers uh, a mount for this volume to this quite well-known location. Um, so when the kubelet now gets started and it starts the containers, 
it will use the token request API of the Cube API server to fetch a token for exactly this pod and this service account, and then set up the mounts and the file systems. Um, the thing that clients now need to do is to actually read the credentials from there, and they should also regularly reload them, since yeah, now the token here has an expiration time, the kubelet automatically re-requests a new token when the validity time approaches and publishes this in place to the same location. So yeah, the client needs to reload it uh, in a regular way every five minutes or whatnot. Um, actually, all major client libraries, client Go and so on, are already supporting this since quite a long time, I think since 1.13 already. So most likely all of this works already quite well in your clusters and more or less out of the box. There's nothing you have to do explicitly other than using a most more reasonably large uh, version of this library. Okay, I'd like to quickly demo this token request API since not everybody might be aware of it. Um, so we have set up here a kind cluster. I hope the font is large enough. And we simply create uh, a service account, which is called robot in this case. And then we use a kubectl command, create token, and we increase the verbosity so that we can actually see what is going on. And the interesting part is basically happening here. So we are sending this kind of request body to the API server uh, that's here. It's a local kind cluster. And we're basically using uh, the token sub-resource of the standard service accounts API. So when we decode this request body here, oops, sick. Then we basically get this JSON document. So that actually looks like a Kubernetes resource of kind token request. Actually, it is not a real resource. It's just yeah, the data that we now send for this single API call. And in the spec, we could configure certain things, audiences, the expiration seconds of the token, maybe a bound object it should be assigned to. kubectl is not doing it here, but the kubelet obviously would set these things when it really starts yeah, a real container. Okay, and what we will get from the API server in response is basically the following. So we still have this token request uh, object that is now filled with some values. So in the status, we, we get our real token that we now can use to authenticate against the API server. We even get informed about the expiration time, and in the spec, it also defaulted a few things that it used for the configuration of this token. Okay, going back to the presentation. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Um, so that's actually the same slide that we saw before. And what I want to point out is the following. You might have seen it. Uh, this is uh, the default expiration seconds that Kubernetes uses when you simply deploy a pod without further configuration. Sure. Um, and so that says that it should be something like an hour or so, an hour and seven seconds. That's actually good so far, so an hour seems to be reasonable, not too long, not too short. Actually, what you can find in the source code, uh, because this number somewhat looks suspicious, right? Six, three, six, or seven, why is it such a strange number? If you look into the source code, then you will find the following, and this here is extracted from the Cube API server, and basically from the function that is issuing uh, yeah, the token. And the interesting part is basically here. So when the extent expiration value is set to true, and the expiration seconds is this three, six, or seven, then it actually silently overrides the expiration to a year, right? And that's probably something we should be aware of. Um, we as a client said we want to have a token for an hour, but what we get is a token for a year. Why is that? Well, in the past, uh, Kubernetes was using tokens without any expiration at all. So clients didn't need to yeah, join the game, basically, and reload the token regularly. It was just valid all the time. And now the community is transitioning to get rid of these uh, tokens without any expiration. So that's why the community wanted to provide enough time for everybody to update their client libraries and to basically 
adapt all the controllers to yeah, play nicely and reload token regularly from the file system. Conclusion out of that is that you might probably want to set this flag on the Cube API server to false. This is actually the thing that controls this kind of magic uh, overwriting of the expiration time. It's still true by default, even in the latest version, 1.27, just released last week. Um, of course, you should first make sure that you have no controllers that are still using a very old library, but in this case, it should be indeed quite old, right? Um, but most probably, you, you can go ahead and, and do this and set it to false. If you cannot control the flag, maybe because you are um, using managed clusters, GKE, where you don't have full control over the API server, then you can also simply use another expiration time, 3.6 or 6, um, something else, to ensure that you have a short validity. Okay, and to complete this uh, service account story, um, one word also to the static token secrets. So, as said, before Kubernetes 1.24, uh, the Kube controller manager was generating such a so-called static token secret for each service account, and you could also not disable that in any reasonable way. So it was always doing this and generating such a token which has no expiration date at all, and that's something yeah, we actually don't want, and, and obviously a security risk. Okay, and that's why the community um, started this cap, which is 2799, with the goal of getting rid of all these uh, static token secrets. And as you can see, the community is still in the process of implementing it. Um, so there are basically three pillars. The first one is about the auto-generation. As said, this is already uh, beta and enabled by default since 1.24 meaning that at least no new uh, such secrets will be generated by Cube Controller Manager. Then there is a feature about tracking the usage so that you can check if you still have entities uh, in your cluster that might rely on such, sec uh, such yeah, token secrets. So there will be, I think, an annotation uh, where you can check the last usage time. And the last thing is actually also an important one about auto cleanup. And that's actually not yet implemented at all. So that means that most probably you still have static token secrets in your cluster and the community will only make it uh, yeah, in the next release, 1.28 as alpha, um, if everything works well, of course, um, and only to beta in 1.29. So that's at least eight months ahead of us. So conclusion here would be uh, that if you are on 1.24 or higher, then you might want to simply manually get rid of these secrets. Of course, first making sure that you have nothing in your cluster that is still relying on them. Um, but as I said, this, all this projected thing and the libraries are updated since quite a while. So chances are quite high that this is already working for you. If you are stuck uh, below 1.24, maybe you cannot upgrade your Kubernetes version for some reasons, then there's also a thing uh, which is uh, invalidating these tokens. So you cannot prevent, prevent Kube Controller Manager from creating new ones, but you can at least invalidate them. And if you are interested in this, then just talk to us. That's actually something that we implemented uh, for our clusters in Gardner because we also support older Kubernetes versions like below 1.24 and still want to have the same uh, security level for all of our clusters. Okay. All right, so now that we know how to use short-lived credentials in Kubernetes with projected service account tokens, let's take a look at the other part of the house, so static credentials, how do we rotate them? In every Kubernetes cluster, there are several static credentials involved. So most importantly, there's the cluster CA, which is used to sign the serving certificate of the API server. But there's also a client CA that is used to sign client certificates for the kubelets to authenticate against the API server. These CAs are typically valid for quite a long time. In Gardner, it's 10 years. In GKE, it's even 30 years, so quite long. There are also other type of credentials like the etcd encryption key or the service account signing key, and these don't have an expiration time built in. So to keep our clusters safe, we should frequently rotate these static secrets. 
Um, but how do you do this at a scale where you manage thousands of clusters like we do with Gardner? It has to be highly automated and most importantly, it has to be disruption free for our clients to get the best experience. So for this challenge, we came up with the following approach for rotating the static credentials in Kubernetes clusters. <clears throat> the rotation is happening in two phases. In the first phase, we issue new credentials, but keep accepting both old and new credentials. And in the second step, we invalidate the old ones, and with this, all the old credentials are gone. What you notice now is that clients need to comply with this process, otherwise it will be a disruption for them. So they need to refresh their credentials after triggering the first phase. And then, once they are ready, they can trigger the second phase and um, invalidate the old credentials. How does this look like in more concrete terms for server certificates as an example? So before the rotation, we have the old CA that is used to sign the server certificate, and the clients only know about the old CA, obviously, so they only trust this one. In the first phase, the server certificate is still signed by the old CA because our clients don't know about the new one yet but they start trusting the new one as they fetch the credentials after triggering the first phase. So they will um, pull that asynchronously and start trusting the new one so they are ready for the next phase where the service certificate is finally signed by the new CA. And then again, asynchronously, the clients can refresh their credentials so uh, they don't trust the old CA anymore. And then it's completely gone from the system. Looking at client certificates, it's a bit different. So again, before the rotation, we have the old CA, which is used to sign the client certificates. And the servers only accept clients authenticating with the old CA. When we start the rotation, the server keeps accepting old, but also the new CA for authentication, and we start signing new client certificates with the new CA. So when the clients refresh their credentials, they get a fresh client certificate that will be trusted from the API server from now on. And in the second phase, the server stops accepting client certificates signed by the old CA, so all old client credentials are invalidated. And by the way, this bundles approach, so keeping old and new in parallel, also works for other type of credentials like the service account signing key. There we use the same approach. The key elements of this principle is that clients need to comply with our rotation. Otherwise, it won't be possible to do it in a disruption-free manner. So they have to refresh their credentials after triggering the first phase. The clients could be humans, for example, using kubectl with a kube config, including a CA bundle, but it could also be cluster components that we control, like the kubelet, using a client certificate. But obviously, we cannot control all the clients, for example, the human clients, so they have to comply and trigger the completion of the rotation once they are ready and have refreshed all their credentials. But if we do control all the clients, if there are non-user facing credentials, we can use the same approach to automatically rotate in a disruption-free manner. So now that we know about the approach we took, how did we implement this? We introduced a new library in Gardner, which is called the Secrets Manager, and this is our implementation in Go of this approach I just described. So we can use it in all of our controllers. And the Secrets Manager manages all types of credentials involved in every Kubernetes cluster in all of Gardner's clusters. So without talking too much about it, let's jump into a live coding session where I can demonstrate this. For my demo, I have prepared a small Go program that is set up to talk against my local kind cluster using a controller runtime client, and I have already initiated a secrets manager instance. 
It just takes a context, log, and a Kubernetes client, most importantly, a namespace where it should manage all the secrets, and an identity to, to distinguish it from other uh, instances. We will take a look at the config later on. I have already written some code to generate a CA that we can use in our demo to sign a server certificate. Um, this is this call right here. We get a secret back and we just lock the name of it so we can start using it. So let's start running this against our, my kind cluster. Right below, I'm watching all the secrets managed by the secrets manager. So there should be some after running this. We see that the secrets manager now generated two secrets actually. One is the actual CA secret, which includes the public and the private key. And the other one is a bundle secret that includes all the public keys. Right now, there is only one instance, one version of the CA, so the bundle only contains one. If I run this code again, we will see that nothing happens. We can still use the secret uh, that the secret manager manages for us, but it keeps the source of truth in the Kubernetes secrets, so um, it, it won't regenerate them if uh, not needed to yeah, prevent any disruption. Okay, so now that we are set up, let's write some code to generate a server certificate. So as, as seen before, we can use the secrets manager instance called generate, and then we give it a secrets config. This time it will be of type server certificate, not of CA. Let's give it a name for the secrets manager. And now we can pass all the usual properties of a certificate, like the common name, for example. The last thing we need to do is tell the secrets manager which CA to use for signing this. So let's give it this option right here. Tell it to use the demo CA we just generated. Let's make sure we don't hit any error or otherwise panic. And let's lock again the name of the secret. Okay, let's run this again. As we can see, the CA is still the same. It didn't regenerate it as before, but there's a new secret in the system, which is called demo server dash something. <clears throat> Let's take a look at this one. So as you can see, this is just a plain Kubernetes secret. There's nothing fancy happening here, no custom resources or whatever. It uses the usual um, keys under the data section, and we can see a lot of labels that is used by the uh, secrets manager to distinguish this uh, secret from others, determine when to uh, regenerate the certificate if the config changes or the CA that is used to sign it changes. One interesting note here is that the uh, secret is managed uh, is, um, is configured to be immutable, meaning that the data section cannot be changed. This is interesting for scalability purposes because the kubelet doesn't have to watch the secret for changes if it's marked to be immutable. This takes off load of the API server. And instead of changing an existing secret, we just generate a new one with a random suffix uh, instead. Okay, so now that we have prepared our credentials, let's start rotating then because that's what we are here for, right? So in order to rotate them, we can trigger the first phase by telling the secrets manager when a given secret should be rotated. So let's say the demo CA should be rotated right now. We pass this on to the config of the manager to tell it about this. Now let's run it again. So as we can see, there is a new demo CA secret with another suffix here. It was just generated uh, eight seconds ago, and the old 
CA secret is still kept. And right now, a new CA bundle secret was generated, which should include, at least in theory, both our CA. So let's take this one. Okay, there are two public certificates in the bundle secret that we can use for trusting our server now. The last thing we need to do is complete the rotation because right now the demo server certificate is still signed by the old one. You can see that at the timestamp. So to trigger the second phase, we need to ignore the old secrets of the demo CA, basically just dropping them from the system, which will automatically generate a new certificate for our server. So let's run this. As you can see, the old CA secret is gone. It's basically disappeared from the system. Uh, our bundle was again regenerated to only include the new CA, and the demo server secret was also regenerated to be signed by the new CA. Okay, let's come back to our slides. Okay, to wrap up this demo, we have seen that the secrets manager uses the Kubernetes secrets as its source of truth. And uh, this is how we implement this two-step approach. But it is obviously also applicable to other applications, not only Kubernetes as an application. And if you want to give it a try, the Go library is also available for importing in, in your controllers. The secrets manager has even more features. Uh, that we can take advantage of. So for example, next level would be our automatic rotation. We can activate this for non-user facing credentials. So for example, for our internal webhook CAs, we specify a validity of only 30 days. And the phase one of the rotation is automatically triggered when approaching end of the validity. After 24 hours of this first step, we complete the rotation by triggering phase two, and with this we have a completely disruption-free and fully automated rotation mechanism to adhere to security best practices. What are the key takeaways of our talk today? Let's wrap it up. First of all, we should use short-lived credentials wherever possible because they are rotated for us, right? We don't have to take care about it. If there are any static service account tokens remaining in our older clusters, we should delete them or at least invalidate them to minimize the security risk. And if we can't use short-lived credentials, then we can rotate the static credentials in two phases. We use the bundles approach in between the two phases to make it disruption-free. We implemented this for Kubernetes as a workload in Project Gardener, but the concept is also applicable to most other workloads. And with this, on to your questions. Any questions here? Thanks for the talk. Um, was there a specific reason for using uh, the secrets resource inside of Kubernetes when storing these uh, certificates that you generated? Uh, is it kind of, is uh, the idea that these uh, kind of controllers that, that manage these ones are privileged because reading and creating and um, kind of updating secrets is quite, quite a powerful privilege in the cluster? Um, so I guess this is some, not something that each individual controller will do more that they will kind of get it all set up before they even start. Is yeah. that correct? That's correct, yeah. In our case, there is a central controller running inside a component called GardenLet that manages all of our user clusters and manages all of them. So it also has to know all the secrets to talk to uh, these clusters. So. Uh, it's already a privileged component, and all the other ones don't need uh, privileges to t um, read and write the secrets. But we keep it central in this location, and it's native to our workload uh, to use 
just simple secret resources. It matches our pattern, basically. Okay, yeah, I, w I was just thinking if you had considered kind of using a custom resource because of there is not more or less kind of um, <coughs> encryption in them, if, if we say it like that. Right. <laughs> Our plane, so, yeah. Okay, thank you.